everyone welcome to freedom solutions dao and uh, we have another episode here which is uh, part of our course series that's focused on the development that uh, we're doing that you guys are uh, helping us support uh, as open source software um, in addition to your donations feedback and uh, sharing right this to, to the whole community so um, this is all part of our course series which is all about the technology we're building and um, why we're doing it how we're doing it and uh, what the business models look like right and then ultimately um, we'll have kind of people spearhead these each each one of these uh, freedom solutions incubations uh, as they get to a certain level of maturity so uberguard is the first one we're going to be focusing on this is basically episode one of Ubercard, which is um, another episode in the freedom solutions uh, dao series uh, the key point or the key reason why we're building this is because we want to develop a solution where safety is actually functional. It's accountable to you. Um, you know, it's, it's capable of, of achieving uh, a real solution based on the laws of physics. Because today, even if we had a perfectly accountable government system, um, the, the reality is that the way we've dispersed safety or, or not so much dispersed, but really centralized safety in a few uh, kind of different areas, such as within the apparatus of government or even provincial government, local government. Um, there's certainly not enough policing to go around. If it was more directly accountable to a particular individual and an individual, individual could choose their level of safety based upon the challenges in their life, um, say like a movie star may, you know, as they do today, may have a bodyguard, whereas, um, you know, some family living in the middle of Montana may not, uh, may not need anything, right? They may be able to defend themselves. And then somewhere in between, perhaps somebody in the city would have, um, you know, security within their apartment complex, and then they may buy some extra security uh, for themselves when they go to certain places or um, perhaps, you know, their own bodyguard, right? That's, that's, uh, works part time, full time, whatever. So there's so a multitude of solutions when you move things into the free market and get them out of the monopoly of the only way of doing things in the government. And this whole mentality of central planning is good for everyone and, and all this other stuff is fundamentally flawed and it's proven by what's going on in the world today, right? So one of the reasons why we wanted to delve quickly into this show or um, delve into this one uh, as a priority is because all the things going on today is it's irrational it's horrible you know there's um there's cops killing innocent people there's in there's people killing cops uh or police you know law enforcement and a lot of this stuff is really a result and this, this division we have between um the people who are meant to protect us and the individuals that live in these various government you know tax farms um, there's this natural friction because the police aren't accountable to us directly, not really. Um, and we'll get into, you know, why that is. Um, obviously, they're accountable directly to uh, government and uh, oftentimes to some sort of local um, police chief or mayor or whatever. And then that's even further abstracted because they're trying to they are following laws. And then that's even further abstracted or relatively uh, you know, un unrefined because then you have to elect politicians to get anything done to actually change those laws. So, so at the very best today, we have a system of accountability that's like 50 years behind what people actually want, right? <laughs> Through this process of democracy and representative government. So, um, the free market is directly accountable to you in real time, all the time. Right. And they can't initiate force and they can't use violence to solve the problems. Otherwise, they go out of business because nobody wants to do business with them. Uh, competitors will take notice that they're initiating force, that they, they, they suck at what they're, you know, the service they're providing or they're violating um, what people find valuable. Right. Which is safety and not the initiation of force. So anyway, we're going to go into the, the depths of this. Um, the whole goal of this particular episode is giving an overview of UberGuard, how it would function, and we're going to be following a um, basically a business plan similar to that of what I've used in the past as an entrepreneur to get raise funding for, um, you know, different businesses and different internal uh, entrepreneurial uh, 
initiatives, right? So, so the whole point is to actually build this to a level that uh, uh, some sort of investor would actually invest in, uh, be it either uh, crowdfunding investors or be it um, uh, traditional investors in VC or uh, you know early early investors, early stage investors, etc. So we're we're following a tried and true model. I'm going to walk through the details so that you guys can see how robust the solution is and how it will actually work. So. Um, Freedom Solution goals, obviously we're looking at a multitude of different incubations, but our, our key focus is obviously on things that enable and push the boundaries of freedom. And I think Uber Guard is, is a really good one. And of course, you guys are gonna have a chance to vote once the, the series are kind of built and you have a, a good understanding of each one of these and then you get a choice uh, to vote which one gets built first. Um, I'm not going to go into all the methodology, but again, you know, as I said in the first episode of this overall Freedom Solution series, we have a very robust methodology that's tried and true to build businesses for the last uh, couple hundred years, right? Or at least the last hundred years. So, um, so I'm not going to go too deep in these goals, but I do want to go into what we're going to model today um, for UberGuard. So we're going to walk through the introduction of UberGuard. Uh, I hit a high level just you know a few seconds ago, but now I'm going to go in deeper into what Uber it is and how it's going to work. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about market traction in terms of hey, are there other people all doing this? What's the competition kind of look like? Um, what does the existing market space look like? In this case, the existing law enforcement, etc. And then what are our challenges, right, at a high level? And kind of a little bit of hint at a solution approach, but. I'm um, trying to make these series as small as possible so uh, and concise as possible, but still as as valuable and impactful um, as they they need to be right to, to get the point across. So UberGuard, what is the concept? So UberGuard is basically a marketplace similar to Uber, well, you know, the taxi cab company, so to speak, the private car company, as they would call it, um, where you can rely on other people like yourself or professionals or college students, it matters not, uh, to provide you a service that you find valuable. In this case, this particular service is a safety service. And we're going to go into the different types of services, but at a high level, things like bodyguards, things like private investigators, things like safety insurance, which covers you in the event of loss, helps get your, um, you know, your losses back. So, you know, if something gets stolen, they help find it. If, uh, if they don't, then they, you know, um, they create, they put, basically put a debt record on, on somebody, uh, who stole it once they've identified it, stole it, all this other stuff, right? So there's ways to, uh, via the free market, prevent losses. Um, risk mitigate losses, get paid back for your losses, uh, and uh, and then ultimately seek recompense, right, from the person who initiated the losses without doing any traditional law, right, that that we that we think of today. That's uh, kind of been stolen and monopolized by the government. Um, and then we're so so again, this is a peer to peer kind of marketplace, both from a business operational perspective where uh, anyone can sign up to be a provider and reputation systems basically define how, you know, what the quality of their service is, what their history has been, so you can build trust. And then, um, so, you know, a college kid could provide services, build up uh, a marketplace by selling his services low as he starts to gain traction, improve his, his self, his confidence, um, in, in his services. Then, of course, he can, you know, raise his prices, expand his portfolio, all this other stuff, right? Same thing with a traditional security company, um, that may exist today, like Pinkerton or a few others. They, uh, could provide their services in the marketplace and sell it and compete against other people and, you know, provide more robust services for businesses or neighborhoods or whatever, right? So anyway, they think of it like Uber, but instead of you calling a, a private cab, you're or a private car, you're basically calling on services for defense. So maybe going out that night um, to uh, a, a pub or to, um, you know, night crawl or something like that, you know, to a multitude of bars and you want uh, a bodyguard. Perfect, val perfectly valid use case. You can pay for that one-time use um, of of that of that service, and never have to use the service again if you don't want to, right? So it all depends. the The world's use cases are at your back and call and your accountability now, right? So again, the goal is to build a D app. The D app being 
um, basically the underlying wrapper of a mobile app. So the front end of all the stuff is going to be a mobile app. Everything we build is mobile centric, mobile first. So um, people actually use it. <laughs> and it, you know, we could tie into all sorts of sensor based stuff uh, like GPS and uh, cell phone uh, uh, coordinates and all these other things, right? So we can triangulate cell towers and get all that sort of um, cell information. So we can provide services that are localized, that are relevant to you, that are based on um, your positioning and where you're going and all this stuff. So mobile first is really just a, a better way to build your software. And then of course you can always build a desktop based uh, interface and solution later if you decide. Um, underneath that though is a D app and that's a decentralized application. The idea is it runs on Ethereum. In this case, most of our core developments focused on Ethereum, but we're not necessarily married to it. Um, so we're, you know, evaluating technologies go along, but for the most part, most of the prototypes will be on Ethereum and likely long-term Ethereum and Bitcoin's blockchain for different, uh, use cases or different subordinate functions or services within the ecosystem, um, will be leveraged. So, uh, there's this whole SOA service oriented architecture design, which we'll get into at some point for the technical geeks. Um, but, uh, which I think is the key methodology of breaking up di these different things into tangible services that aren't complex that are um not that basically are not easily uh you know don't don't have a big risk to them in terms of having a wide functionality profile and things of that nature so uh don't want to get too deep in the, the tech at the moment that's going to be in a future um, episode but uh, just want to give you guys a feel on how we're actually going to build this and the fact that they are decentralized applications like Bitcoin and like, you know, the Ethereum blockchain and all those other things, they're, they're basically immutable and they're unstoppable. So once we create this, government can't come around and say, well, we're going to shut you down. Good luck. <laughs> like you really can't. You'd have to stop the entire Ethereum network or Bitcoin network or whatever. And of course, we would just fork things. And we'd move it on. So um, the reality of freedom is that it's going to happen regardless of whether the state wants it or whether um, individuals want it. Like say you're a statist and you like controlling people and telling people what to do. Um, sucks to be you because it's not going to happen any longer. So, um, anyway, so we'll get into the tech and why that's possible. And actually, I have another episode coming out, which is all about decentralization of both business models and technology and why the future is, is anarchy anyway. So either get on the bus or get left behind. <laughs> all right. So real safety. Again, the whole point of this is real safety. It's all accountable to you. Um, these people, just like Uber drivers, are, you know, your service provider. They're accountable to you. You pay them. You tip them if you desire, whatever. You, you give them feedback. You control them and what they do for you, right? So no more of this abstracted bullshit that we have today. All right. So I want to get into some of the philosophy and some of the science behind why safety is so important to people. Why this sticking point is so crucial for so many people as to why, you know, everyone says, okay, great. I agree with, you know, mo most people, when you can get them down and distill the whole freedom versus statism type argument, and you get them all the way down to the core, uh, even people like Ron Paul, and you, you go, you get them all the way down to the core and they go, well, you know, we still need a mechanism of safety. We still need a mechanism of rule of law and all this other stuff. Um, but yeah, that, that does exist. That's called the free market. That's called business. Like every business has its own rules. You follow those rules, right? Or you don't do business with that person. Uh, every individual has their own rules. You follow the rules or you don't get to interact with that person. So the whole point is that what these people misunderstand is that there is not one universal law, you know, or rule, or rule set, right? Which is like the body of law. There's only NAP. Right. So the non-aggression principle or yeah, even as Stefan Molyneux has kind of matured it into universally preferable behavior, UPB, there's only one universal. Right. And that's the non-initiation of force. Everything else is choice. Right. Doesn't really matter. So long as you don't initiate force, doesn't really matter. Right. Uh, you do drugs, your choice. You want to engage with prostitutes, your choice. Right. All this other stuff. Uh, whether, whether it's right, wrong, or indifferent on a interpersonal level, totally different 
thing, right? You know, if you're cheating on your wife, uh, you have a contract between you and your wife or you and your girlfriend verbally, right? If that's part of your relationship, that you don't have an open relationship or whatever, then yeah, it's a violation. You're violating that person, right? But these, these are choices, right? These are not universals. The only universal is I cannot initiate force. So anyway, so to understand what safety is, we have to go back to kind of, you know, principles, we have to go back to science, we have to go back to psychology, we have to go back to uh, philosophy, right? Philosophy is the umbrella of all this stuff. And so what is safety, right? What, what is safety? Safety in and of itself is, is basically the incarnation of anything that doesn't initiate force, right? So anything that is voluntary is by definition safe. Now safety, in order to ensure a safe safe ecosystem which is what safety is is that you you need to build a, a scenario or or provide a defense mechanism to ensure safety and that's what UberGuard is right so UberGuard is going to be the means by which you you leverage public services to defend you know the the your ability to uh use voluntary trade right and voluntary interaction so safety is basically anything that doesn't initiate force and the means to ensure that you know that reality right which is what uber is going to be so why is it so important that's an important thing because because a lot of people don't realize why we're biologically driven and why this is such a paramount concern for most people, right? Going back to what I was saying earlier, the reason why all these people that are minarchist or um, quote unquote libertarians that have believe in some form of the state is, is because they have this biological urge all the way at the bottom of the near the bottom of this of Maslow's pyramid, which is uh, safety. And so they know that's the one thing that they're super concerned about. And they're like, okay, if we don't have a, a way of providing a, a safety mechanism uh, to everyone, then they're afraid, right? And so if you look at Maslow's hierarchy, there's the physiological, right? So there's the the eating, the sleeping, the uh, the excreting, uh, you know, going to the bathroom. There's the procreation, all that other stuff. That stuff is foundational. So again, like your biological urges will override anything else that's going on at any one given time you're maybe you're in a meeting and you're talking to people or maybe even having sex or whatever and and if a biological urge comes that's gonna supersede everything so again it's, it's all these kind of lower on the pyramid you go the higher the priority these things are to human beings and they're much less likely to give those things up right so you have to build a solution that actually solves for these for human beings concerns in these areas right so we can never build a solution that doesn't allow people to eat <laughs> we can never build a solution that doesn't allow people to sleep we can never build a solution that doesn't allow people to excrete or procreate and we can never build a solution or you rarely build a solution that doesn't allow people to feel safe or at least given the illusion of safety, right? So, so in, in, when you're building any sort of system, whether it's a predatory system like government or they initiate force or whether it's a non-initiation of force like the free market and the free trade, then you can, you, you have to satisfy it for these lower level pyramid concerns regardless. Like you, at least in the predatory ecosystem where they're violating safety, uh, governments violating safety on a regular basis and police are oftentimes uh, they have to give the illusion of safety at the very least and then have to provide some safety so that you know like it feels like it's tangible and at the bare minimum they can't mess with physiological functions right now now imagine if we we let these things live in the free market right where we have these uh, not only your biological functions which are completely untouched today but also your your safety functions now imagine you get to choose your level of safety. You could defend yourself. You get to ask other people to help defend you. You can have competing services. They're actually accountable to you. Right? So anyway, the reason why it's so paramount that we solve this for, um, in order to achieve freedom is that until that pillar has been solved, people will never accept uh, true freedom or anarchy, right? Anarcho capitalism. All right. So what do people find valuable about law enforcement then? Right. You, you know, because I was I was just saying, well, government initiates force and all this other stuff. Well, it goes back to safety. It goes back to we're uh, government provides the illusion of safety. And there are some discrete functions that um, individuals within law enforcement provide that are true safety.
Like, you know, there's typical kind of personas in every facet of life in every career choice. So in um, police, there's people who are predators in, and uh, there's also people who are benevolent and who want to help people. Like there's, those are the two kind of bipolar worlds where, where either someone wants to join law enforcement because they want to inflict violence on someone and control someone, or someone wants to join law enforcement because they want to help someone, right? That happens happens a lot, actually. I think I've met a number of, of uh, police officers and people in law enforcement in general, and I'd say, you know, at least my interactions, it's been uh, maybe 70-30, right? Where, you know, they're they're kind of hesitant to just follow along with the law and they kind of want to, you know, make sure you're actually a bad guy and all this other stuff. So, you know, there is, it's just this natural kind of scenario where you're going to have good with bad, right? Like anything in life. The only problem with law enforcement and government the way we have today is that it attracts the most socio sociopaths right so it attracts the most violent people in our society because you have access to so many tools either as a police officer which you know you have other police officers you have the rule of law behind you you have um, all these other things that are going to steal money from people all these are the ways and means to exact and inflict your violence so it's going to attract the craziest people for sure now that doesn't mean it won't attract as well good people because of the original mission to protect and serve but you're going to get a lot of bad people right you know like flaunt and moths to a flame right just like government that's why we have the craziest highest iq people uh, the highest, I, the highest IQ or of the crazy people in pol politics today, right? So, so the presidency, the Congress, the Senate, all these other people, most of those people are the bright evil people, right? <laughs> that are, that are attracted to the biggest mechanism of inflicting violence. So anyway, the functions that are valuable today in law enforcement are all be there because of individuals. So one of the key distinctions I want to make is that law enforcement is a label. Uh, government's a label. All these things are labels, right? They're not there. Um, obviously, a police officer is a defined role or a job description, but the individual performs the actions. The individual owns the results of their actions, right? So at the end of the day, you have a choice to either be a good human being or a rational human being, I should say, or, or not, or an unrational human being, right? And, and this doesn't matter whether you're in law enforcement or business or whatever. It doesn't matter what you do. Every moment of your life, you have a choice, rational, irrational, right? And so you got to consider that in law enforcement, there's individuals. Individuals do things. Police don't do things, right? Individuals do. And so all these things that police do can either be done by me or you or anyone else. It, you don't need some magical costume or um, some system of predatory violence to, you know, called laws to to ensure uh, that you can defend someone. Like you don't need that. You don't need it at all. All you need is someone's consent uh, to provide a service. Or in the case where someone is being actively aggressed against, everyone has the the right to go defend someone. Right. So I mean, it, it's just it's just rational for people to say this can only be consolidated in one apparatus called government and follow one set of laws. The only law, like I said, that everyone needs to follow, the only rule everyone needs to follow is the non-aggression principle. You cannot initiate force. So, anyway, so, so in order to first define what people find valuable about law enforcement, we have to go back to, again, like I mentioned, what is safety? So I kind of hinted at safety is basically anything that isn't the initiation of force. So by definition, if you don't initiate force, that thing is safe because it's voluntarily chosen. Um, then from there, anything the opposite, right? Thus is then anything that does initiate force is of course not safety. So if police officers or individuals in the role of policing initiate force against you, they're the criminals. They're the violent actors, right? Just, just like anybody else would, just like me, you, or anyone else. So it's important to make these distinctions. There is no magical, you know, uh, fairy wand that gets passed over people when they put on a badge, right? It, it, it does, it's not, it's, it's mysticism. It doesn't make any sense. They're just human beings like everyone else. And some of them trying to do good. Some of them aren't, right? 
So let's build a system that incentivizes good behavior and disincentivizes bad behavior. Because today, with law enforcement, you have a system that cares not about, you know, good behavior, bad behavior, right? Rational behavior, irrational behavior. Uh, it's all about just following the law regardless. Like, you know, there's like, there's tons of laws, tons, and most of them are about victimless crime. So no victim, there is no crime, right? That's a pretty rational thought process that almost everyone has, but in law, doesn't matter. Law enforcement follows it. An individual in the role of being a police officer follows that rule that he's been given instead of quitting his job, instead of finding a different job, instead of not joining a police force in the begin with. Instead of not going into the private market and building his own policing company, right? His own, his own safety company. So, so an individual at the end of the day has to make that choice. And they're making a choice to initiate violence just as much as you would or a criminal would. So what, what are examples of, you know, safety or safe, you know, interactions? Well, trade. Trade is a perfect example of a voluntary exchange between two parties who are better off because they did the, they did the trade. Right. Thus, it's voluntary. Thus, it's safe. Thus, it's it's uh, it's nonviolent. It doesn't violate anyone. So, what's the counterexample? Right, theft. Well, theft by definition, it's a subset of violence. Right, the Greeks terms, which is the Greek termed the kind of defined it as to violate. Right, it's been bastardized over the years by uh, you know people seeking political power and and all this other thing to people with agendas and motives to try to change the world word into something physical like a physical interaction that's unwanted or unwarranted when in reality it, it can mean it's anything from uh, verbal abuse to spanking to hitting to killing or murdering i should say etc so the important part is to understand that um, by definition violence uh, a theft is a subset of violence and violence can be anything which violates another human being so, so what we want to do is we want to get away from that, right? We want to move away from a system that incentivizes violations or violence uh, against the people it's supposed to be rep representing, right? So, so it's supposed to be protecting us, but yet it's, it's exacting violence. So we're going to go into, um, you know, the specific examples of what most people would say I find valuable about law enforcement. So what people are really saying is they actually find the individuals and their actions valuable, not law enforcement in and of itself. So as an example, say, say an officer helps someone during a car accident. They pull them out of the vehicle or they, you know, they talk to them about what went on or, or help them, you know, solve the problem of the accident or whatever occurred, right? That's all helpful. And anybody can do that. Doesn't require an officer. Generally, most of the times, doesn't require training, although that's a nice value add. But anybody can assist, right? Someone else, anyone can aid someone else. Um, they take reports of crimes to provide documented evidence to investigate the scene to enable us to figure out who was at fault, who uh, owes recompense, who should be, who should be provided that recompense, and you know what? How do we solve? You know this problem in the future ideally well, of course that's not really part of the job description but that should be the logical consequence of of writing these reports is we should identify okay how do we risk mitigate this scenario of hap from happening in the future um the presence right just like a gun or a camera or um, a security guard or whatever their presence helps defend people right because it it creates a disincentive for violent or irrational actors uh, regardless of their of their costume, police or otherwise, to to initiate violence, right? So so just their presence or security guard's presence or a gun. So if somebody's you know carrying a gun, or if people think everyone's carrying a gun, then it disincentivizes bad behavior, right, or irrational behavior. So um, the other major use case is that obviously law enforcement on occasion is and i do mean on occasion is engaged in actively seeking out an aggressor or using defensive force to mitigate an aggressor during a critical incident and what we mean by critical incidents kind of nomenclature in the law and law enforcement safety industry for um 
you know, something that's happened, right? So someone's initiated violence. There's a lot of chaos oftentimes. And so you as an, as a rational actor in the scenario, you're a nonviolent actor in the scenario, trying to figure out what's going on. Um, your life's at stake, other people's lives at stake. That's a critical incident, right? So, so like a mugging, um, a, uh, a terrorist attack or any sort of violent altercation is considered a critical incident. And so, so that's, you know, another valid use case. So let's distill these down into their functions, the primary functions of what ideally safety services should provide. Should provide aid, support, uh, reporting, a presence to disincentivize uh, irrational actors and defense. So they should, you know, go out and seek these things. All these things can be done by you, can be done by the free market, can be done by anybody, doesn't really matter, right? So that's an important takeaway. Individuals protect people. Law enforcement doesn't. It's just a label. They have no special mechanism for protecting people. They have no special means. Training can be done by anybody. And actually, oftentimes, when you look at the statistics, it has nothing to do with training. It just happens to be in the right place at the right time, which cops oftentimes are not. <laughs> they're generally responders, and they're generally not in um, or around you when you actually need them, right? It's just, just laws of physics. It's not their fault necessarily um, outside of the fact that they don't get enough funding to have enough police officers, all this sort of stuff. But again, you wouldn't want that because they're actually the primary aggressors. There's actually less criminals, quote unquote, um, peer on peer criminals than there are criminals in law enforcement initiating violence, right? So we'll go into statistics in another episode, but it's um, important to understand that you want these people will be accountable to you first before you start spending more money. Um, so what do people find not valuable about law enforcement today, right? So people find, um, you know, when, when you're pulled over for supposedly a traffic violation, generally, you know, it's, you know, I, I'm sure there's plenty of cases or maybe even most of the time people are being pulled over for um, rational things like, you know, potentially speeding or, or other things. But in the reality, it's a violation of someone to impede their movement. Like you're basically kidnapping that person for this period of time because they didn't choose to do it. They just know that when the flashing lights hit, if they don't stop, they're going to get ran off the road or shot out or whatever. Right. So, so there's a disincentive of violence to respond to someone pulling you over when there really shouldn't be. Right. So, so like how the market would deal with traffic violations and moving violations, all these other things in would be, we would have different roads. So like there'd be one segment of road, which would be the, you know, no speed limit zone and you go as fast as you want. Right. So it wouldn't be an issue. There would be, you know, potentially um, self-driving cars and all these other things. Right. So the free market would build solutions to solve problems without initiating violence. Because of the initiated force, then it's not a solution. It just means you're a violent criminal, right? And nobody pays for violent criminals by choice, right? We have to pay through taxation, which is stolen from us. So, so anyway, so, um, the, the other use cases are tickets, right? Obviously, this is just another form of taxation most of the time that you're not actually violating someone else and, you know, in terms of, uh, as an excuse for them actually writing a ticket. Um, these are generally just excuses to fund the, the system and for people and for government to remind you that, uh, you know, that they're there, that they have the violent stick and they can use it against you, right? Um, Again, uh, the, the other major one, of course, that people are really upset about is the use of force against someone without provocation. So violent force, such as murder, assault, you know, police brutality, all this other stuff. So um, this is a big, big issue. And this is why people, I, it, and this is one of the, the biggest problems with government too, is that it creates these, these kind of these, um, I would say these incubation pots, right? Where they, these melding pots where they take a, you know, a, a violent actor and give him authority and call him law enforcement, claim he's doing something benevolent when in actuality, he's just spending most of his day violating you. <laughs> and then you're not allowed to say anything and you're not allowed to defend yourself. But if, if another peer did that, if your neighbor did that, you would have the right to defend yourself. So like it's a totally irrational, sets up these, these scenarios where people hate police officers regardless, like it just creates this uh, archetype uh, and persona where people just hate them, period, because the government set up this predatory environment um, where they have a superior means of creating uh, 
you know, predation against you. Whereas that's something you could never do against someone else like your neighbor naturally. Um, so anyway, so it's, it's, it's just, it's just petri dish, right. Of, of creating violence and, and incentivizing violence and, and making people, um, hate each other so that they can divide and conquer. So don't fall into it. Just, you know, let's build some solutions to get out of that world that, that actually builds some real safety solutions and, and then government will dissolve because it have no value. So let's, let's move forward. Right. Um, so anyway, double standards, like, you know, law enforcement is allowed to lie, but you're not. Um, obviously they can lie and not be held liable. Uh, this is both in court as well as just, you know, uh, talking to you on the side of the road or, you know, as you walk down the street, they can, they have every right to, um, engage in a conversation, right? Just as anyone else would, but they actually have a motive, right? Anything they say can be used against you. Anything, uh, or anything you say can be used against you. Anything they say cannot be held, used for your, def and necessarily for your defense, right? Um, generally gets thrown out and, uh, is, is not, uh, viable, right? Because it's a, a hostile witness. But anyway, um, so, so let's distill these down to functions. What's really going on here when people say these are the things I don't find valuable about law enforcement? Well, what's really going on is the initiation of force, just like any other criminal, quote unquote criminal, violent actor, irrational actor, as I like to call them, because, you know, it's really the umbrella is, um, initiation of force. So they're no different than any other criminal, right? No different. And, and again, this, they're individuals. Some are criminals, some aren't. Sometimes people will do a criminal action one day, next day they won't, right? So again, it's it's a double standard, it's irrational, it's what's creating a lot of this violence, a lot of this hatred towards each other, when in reality, the safety function should be a free market solution, right? So um, so anyway, the goal is let's let's get rid of these things that people don't find value in in law enforcement when we build a free market solution. So how do we solve this, right? Well, going back at what I hinted at in you know, earlier in the presentation is we built a free market for safety. Again, this is something like a mobile app, like I mentioned earlier, um, which is built on decentralized technology. So it's unstoppable. It can't be manipulated. It can't be shut down, all that other stuff. Um, functions very similar to Uber. Again, you get to leverage other people's services for your own safety. Um, it provides... Uh, major functions like bodyguards, private investigators, insurance, uh, security guards or security operations for larger scale safety, such as, um, malls or businesses or neighborhoods, et cetera, or maybe even townships potentially, right? You know, if people want to say, Hey, these five neighborhoods, um, you could be protected. I, I don't think that would make sense. Generally, you would break them up in the neighborhoods at the, probably the biggest scale, but overall, you know, you could of course choose how to do it, how you want to provide your safety in the free market. And that's self-defense, right? So the reality is, is that the best defense is you defending yourself. Not everybody has the means, not everybody has the skills, not everybody has the mental awareness and wherewithal or the training to kind of defend themselves. But obviously there is plenty of people who, who can defend themselves, do defend themselves and do it quite well. And that's the ideal scenario because the laws of physics dictate that the one person that is always going to be near you is, or, you know, with you is you, right? So, so if you're able to defend yourself, that's the highest order of safety. The next highest order is a bodyguard. And then it can kind of layers down from there in terms of the ability to, to protect you in, in different scenarios, right? So, um, we can enable all of these different use cases and all of these different services to provide solutions that are actually accountable to you don't initiate violence at all ever and they provide the same functions that you wanted in the beginning so the very first slide we went or very first slide when we talked about uh what's valuable what's not you get all the things that you find valuable and none of the things that you find not valuable right so um again the whole idea is we build a reputation system into UberGuard, we build a peer-to-peer -peer exchange for services in UberGuard, and you now have ubiquitous access to these safety services which run the gamut from say a college kid providing a bodyguard service or an entry-level type service to all the way to a security operations service um and an insurance company that you know writes reports that gets you know tries to reclaim losses they can, um, you know, uh, basically create an entry on a credit report for someone who's stolen from you to get, to get, you know, to incentivize that person to give you back what you, they stole or the value of what they stole. Um, 
these reports or these investigators could actually provide a you know a public service which talks about during the transition phase um, whether or not this particular police department is following the non-initiation of force or not so so there's going to be um, one of the things I want to talk about is there's going to be like this this transition period right where there's going to be existing government uh, police force or law enforcement while there's a a more robust set of free market services available via UberGuard and insurance companies will be incentivized to create reports that say okay well this group in say this state or this county or this sheriff or whatever is initiating violence more than these other ones or is initiating violence at all and that's why you should use these services these free market services over here uh, as opposed to in that particular region as opposed to these to protect yourself and there could be scenarios where in Uber guards, you could have someone who is not only a bodyguard, but also someone who protects you from law enforcement even where, you know, they are kind of, you know, they're, they have a camera, you know, in this transition, transitionary period where they have a camera always on them. They're filming you. They're making sure you're safe or they're doing it for the neighborhood or they set up surveillance systems to watch police officers to keep them accountable in the government ecosystem in which they operate today until they become privatized, right? So that, so there's going to be, I think one of the biggest industries that have come out of this or sub industries that have come out of this is measuring the current performance of government law enforcement so we can point out you know the violence in their system and point out the opportunities and the alternatives in the free market and keep them accountable so that they don't use violence against us as we transitioned into a non-violent free market of safety services so how do people benefit right all parties benefit now uh, law enforcement and safety providers benefit because they get paid more than they currently do um, and we'll go into all the numbers. We've done a fair amount of research on kind of what, you know, current compensation looks like, including pensions and all this stuff versus what the likely rate or would be in the marketplace and things of that nature. Um, so, so law enforcement people would get paid more. You, you get more value for what you're doing and you wouldn't be initiating force on a regular basis. Um, they're providing services directly to the individual. So, you know, they have a better quality of life. They, you know, get more fulfillment out of actually helping people and providing services that people want. Um, they are basically the, the service providers themselves. So people that are formerly in law enforcement or the net new safety providers, they are much safer than law enforcement is because people don't hate them <laughs> because they've not been put into this ecosystem of why well, I have to follow these laws and I have to initiate violence against people and occasionally I get to actually help people right so in this case in the free market scenario you're always helping people right you're always you're always doing something of value you're always doing something that people want and people are paying you for it um, it removes the desire for either party to initiate force against each, each other right producer or consumer because obviously now a a law enforcement or safety or no longer law enforcement, but a safety provider would never want to initiate force against, you know, the people that they're accountable to and the people that they're accountable to say the consumer would never want to initiate force against another consumer because you know, unless they're violating them, because then they would be held accountable for what their law enforcement or what their safety provider is doing. Right. Um, and so it's one of those scenarios where everyone becomes nice because no one wants to initiate violence against someone else. And so you're not going to have a bunch of irrational customers going around telling um, these safety providers to go kill some random dude down the street. A, they wouldn't do it because they're not automatons now. They're accountable to the market, not just to the consumer, which is, means their overall consumer base. And the consumers themselves wouldn't want to do that because then, you know, there'd be mutual assured destruction, right? They, they'd, uh, they'd either, you know, get attacked by the other people or it would be embarrassing. Like no, no one in the, no one in the world would say, yeah, it's okay for you to write that into your contract that you can go kill someone's neighbor. Now, in a defense scenario, that's valid, but you already have that that right, right? You already have the right to protect your property and your family, etc., either yourself or via third party, which is a service provider. So, so anyway, this this apocalyptic scenario that people do write and build about um, oh, well, there'll just be a bunch of private defense agencies and they'll just attack each other and they'll just kill everyone else. And like, it's, it's what's going on today. Like law enforcement's killing a bunch of people. Uh, Non-law enforcement people are killing a bunch of people. 
So you're actually writing about what's really going on today, not what the new world would be, right, in the, in the free market scenario. So what are the benefits to you as an individual? Well, the defense service provider is directly accountable to you. So again, they're not going to be writing you tickets. They're going to be protecting you. They actually defend you. They're going to um, inform you. You know, they're going to they're going to provide you information on you know what's safe, what isn't, what your safety level is at any one given time. They'll probably build an app which gives you a threat meter. Like you walk into um, a bigger city or you drive into a bigger city, your threat meter starts to go up because there's more potential for violent people or whatever. Right. And, uh, and so you'll get all these valuable tools and valuable services that make your life better. Um, much less cost because today you're not only is government stealing from you to supposedly pay for these services, but then most of the people in government are actually keeping that money themselves. <laughs> so most of the politicians are like, yeah, I'll take 80% and then I'll put 20% into public safety. And, you know, and sometimes they don't do it directly. Obviously, a lot of times they'll, they'll funnel it through companies or other services that are their friends and that money gets back to them. Believe me, happens all day long. Um, both in corporate organizations as well as government, but government enables it to happen, right? So, um, so, so there's actually a lot less money than your taxation going to actual services that you want, like safety and fire and all these other things. Um, so reduces overhead. It reduces cost, net, net cost to you. It redu it increases the pay to the service providers, the, 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 uh, the safety providers. It decreases brutality because now everyone's super accountable to everyone else and uh, increases reporting on existing violence organizations. I consider the government to be a terrorist organization. They meet the FBI's definition of a terrorist organization and they are the ones responsible for roughly 90% of the violence, the theft, the murder, the uh, incarceration of people. So, so, so the kidnapping of people, all this stuff. It's not really happening between peers. It's mostly happening between a centralized apparatus called government and the rest of us, right? So, so again, most of the violence would go away anyway. What remains, you know, as, as, as outliers or edge cases of irrational actors would be pretty minimal and would certainly be mitigated by, you know, these solutions here, uh, being provided by UberGuard. Plus we would measure the governments that would remain during this transitionary period. So we know who's the most violent, what they're doing, and we'd have all of this publicly available information, which would help change opinion and help move people into the free market instead of voting, right? Um, and then the last is the last argument is that people who don't participate in UberGuard are still better off because of it. And the reason why is because they're better off for all these other things I mentioned, like, you know, the, the, the reduced police brutality, there's bigger scrutiny on policing, um, uh, you know, people, you know, that are, that are still involved in the government system or the state or whatever, even if they're not using these Uber Guard services, they still benefit because they're going to get, you know, beat up less and all these other things, right? Because we're watching the, you know, the government even more now. So anyway, the whole point is that there's not a negative consequence in building a free market solution wrapped around the accountability that's necessary to provide public safety. Right, individual safety, right? So um, we're going to go into more details in the next episode around, you know, like market traction, market size, you know, how many people would actually sign up for the service, how many people are being using quote unquote government services today. Um, how many, you know, what, so what is the total addressable market? What's the numbers there? What's the financials there? What is comp, what does competition looks like? Cause there's actually looks like there's a couple companies out there that are just starting that are trying to do like peer to peer bodyguards, but not the rest. So you got to look at the whole gamut of the marketplace. What's out there today? Um, what's right? What's wrong? What are some of the risks of the business model and how do we make it mitigate those risks? Again, decentralization is going to go a long way to mitigating our, all our risks. And, um, and then we go into all these different levels so that people have a firm foundation for how this business would operate and they can invest in it. And, uh, then we can develop and make sure that it's available to everyone. So looking forward to everyone's feedback and comments on both the video, um, what we're doing with this particular, uh, incubation, as we would call it, this kind of prototype, this UberGuard prototype. Obviously, this entire show is fueled by you. 
Uh, you, you guys fund the show. You guys are, are paying for the show. You guys are the ones who are making the show successful. So if, um, if you guys don't share, if you guys don't subscribe, if you guys don't talk, if you don't, don't provide feedback, then the show will stagnate, right? The goal is for you guys to, to sh and make sure people are aware of what's going on, aware of how we can solve these things. Um, make sure that uh, you're doing it to help fuel the show. Obviously, as we go forward, there's going to be ways you can donate to specific software applications, etc., versus just the show in general. But um, the show is really the me, the major way in which we accomplish what we're trying to get done here, which is providing both an awareness vehicle as well as a way to collaborate with everyone during the development process and uh, get the ideas out there. Make sure that we have a market out there once we do develop the software and get it matured really rapidly. So please uh, like, subscribe, donate. I appreciate it, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye.